Professor. Professor over at NYU. Uh, and it's, uh, it's great to be here. So this is my third year now being back here. So it's amazing to see how this has grown and the quality has really increased. Um, so I want to talk about some of our work in trying to understand bias in 301 on data and 301 on reporting. Uh, and this work, just to give you some context, is funded by a larger project uh, that, uh, that we have uh, with the MacArthur Foundation, where we're trying essentially to focus on data science projects that can provide implementable solutions for city agencies to some more intractable kind of social related problem. So this is one of about five projects that we're working on right now and at the tail end of that. Uh, definitely like to acknowledge also our, our co-authors on this. Bo Young Hung is a PhD student in my lab and Christy Korsberg, who is a student at CUSP who just recently graduated. And also like to thank uh, Chenda Fruchter, who's the senior director at 311, who has been really instrumental in this work and kind of working hand in hand. And I'll talk about why that's important in a second. So uh, 301 is the kind of granddaddy of all of the open data, right? It's really an exciting way to understand uh, the city landscape, what people are concerned about, where problems are. Uh, about 8 million calls a year come into 301. Of those, about 2.6 million turn into what are called service requests, which is actually something that you know, the city needs to eventually act on. Um, and I think what triggered this project was very much increasingly we're seeing these 311 data used for all sorts of predictive models to do uh, you know, anticipatory and kind of preemptive uh, assessments and inspections uh, to allocate city resources. And there was a real concern that, of course, all of these resource allocations, so these kind of really vital city services, were being uh, potentially were being allocated based on uh, some inequitable or biased uh, measure, which is how often people call to complain. And so fundamentally, the question is, can we understand and can we quantify differences in complaint behavior? Because the reality is that for lots of different reasons, people are going to complain at different rates. So people may have uh, different levels of trust in the local government. They might, might have different levels of access to technology. They might have language uh, barriers that prevent them from calling. Or they might just be really sensitive about different things. So some people might be really sensitive to noise. Some people might be really sensitive to rats, whatever the case may be. So we really wanted to get at this. Um, so our goals are essentially to understand and estimate this, the socio-spatial variance, so not only how it varies across neighborhoods, but what are the fundamental demographic and cultural characteristics that influence this difference. Uh, of course, understand exactly what this relationship, or as best we can, this relationship between some of these socioeconomic factors are and complaint behavior. And then ultimately provide some metrics that 301 could use to kind of adjust on the fly as complaints are coming in to understand how that varies. So to say, if you're going to get 20 complaints from Sunset Park, what is that really, how do you even that out against 20 complaints on the Upper East Side, depending on what the, play, the complaint behavior might actually be? So just to give you a sense of the landscape, this is complaints per capita in 2016. Uh, so it gives you a rough sense of where people are complaining, at least uh, per person. Um, so our method was essentially uh, three steps. One is uh, we're focusing on predicting uh, hot, heat and hot water problems across the city. We're then looking at how that compares back to actual complaint behavior, and then contextualizing this by looking at underlying socioeconomic and demographic characteristics of the different neighborhoods. Now, the most important piece of this, I think, is the first piece, which is the challenge here is we need ground truth. You know, we can't naively go in and just say, this is what the average complaint uh, per capita is, complaint rate per capita. This is how it varies by neighborhood. We need some ground truth because there's an inherent endogeneity in 311 data. We're reporting on conditions that we only know about because people are reporting them. So what is, how do we figure out what is truth in the absence of the 311 complaint? So we went through a lot of iterations on this. Uh, we, we settled on trying to figure out heat and hot water complaints. Uh, one, because it's one of the major complaint types, uh, up with noise and, uh, uh, in kind of what people complain about. Um, it's also really a pressing social issue that disproportionately affects lower income uh, communities. Um, so we started by, and we also thought uh, kind of a priori that we could understand that all things being equal, uh, that the likelihood of a heat or hot water complaint could be boiled down to uh, physical conditions of the actual building, the types of boilers, the age of the building, those kind of things. So we thought this was one test. I mean, if you guys have better ideas, other ideas, please. Let me know. We're working on other ways of using our sensor data for this ground truth, as opposed to trying to kind of back into it. But this is how we approached it. Um, so this is our data. So what I'll present today is just what we did on the open data. Uh, and the idea here is hopefully that you all can reproduce this, challenge this, figure out new ways. But these are our data sources. Uh, it's all in the paper as well. So I won't get into the, uh, the details. 
Uh, and just a little background on in the 2016-2017 heating season. So the heating season runs from October 1st to May 31st, uh, when by law, owners of residential buildings are required to provide heat. Now, they're only required to provide heat also with some certain temperature differential. So it's not clearly that the heat always has to be on October 1st to May 31st, but that has to be available given certain temperature conditions. So you can get a rough estimate of kind of where the violations are and when the complaints are. We focused on uh, multiple dwellings. Buildings were registered as multiple dwellings. Um, for a number of reasons, one, we think that these are going to, we're going to see very different complaint behavior than some of the smaller properties. We also excluded buildings where the owners live in the building because that also would respond, you know, people would respond differently in that, in that context as well. You'll notice that not many buildings are actually getting violations. So there's an imbalanced sample here that we're going to have to deal with. Um, so this is essentially what we learned. We're kind of getting at, so we've built a classification mo uh, model here. So they didn't, we're, uh, here we're using a gradient boosting classifier to account for some nonlinearity in this, uh, and also perform the best of the various machine learning models that we attempted. Here are the kind of initial input variables, and you could get a sense, again, these are primarily physical related uh, variables, um, although we tried to also get at some management quality, which is another difficult, difficult one to, to attract, to, uh, to address. And our training data was on the 23, 2013 to 2016, and we tested it against 2016-17 data. So we did OK. We had to apply synthetic minority oversampling technique to account for the imbalanced sample, which improved our, uh, our performance uh, quite a bit. I mean, we got about 80%, which is OK. When we use proprietary data, the worst stuff we're working on now, we get much better than that. Uh, but really important for us was to increase the sensitivity. sensitivity. We wanted to diminish or lower the, the false negative right here, because this is really a major problem. Even if we just stop here, and we've talked to HPD about this, for instance, if they tried to use this for targeted enforcement, the last thing they want to do is use a model that makes them miss something. Right? So they would rather have, uh, they would rather kind of, uh, have the model over-predict where they would expect problems to occur. So again, this is just the, the output and the relative feature importance uh, across, uh, across the model. So from there, we essentially combine where we would expect problems to actually occur to where actual complaints took place. And we did this uh, in a kind of a binary kind of process where we just mismatch buildings based on uh, that kind of matrix of whether we, there was a predicted problem and whether there were reports, complaint, uh, uh, reports uh, complaints actually reported. And one of the things we also had to do here is we had to adjust for household or building size, residential unit size, right? So one complaint from a 100-unit building is different from a one complaint from a five-unit building. So we accounted for this, and we're looking at this differential between what we essentially have as mismatched buildings. So we have then classified these as under-reporting and over-reporting. I think it's quite simple to kind of say what under-reporting is is where we expect a problem but don't see complaints at the same rate versus over-reporting where we don't expect a problem but we're seeing a certain degree of complaints. So this is essentially, a, this is a heat map of what, we, uh, of what we found at the BBL level. So this is somewhat skewed based on the concentration of BBLs of multiple dwellings across the city, but it gives you some rough cut of where we're seeing these two, uh, these two groups. And then to put it a different way, we actually tied this back to CBG, census block group data, and classified every census block group based on whether it's over-reporting, under-reporting, or kind of an as-expected condition. And you could see the variation across the city. It is quite mixed, but there's also interesting pockets that vary quite a bit from the per, per capita complaint data that we just look at kind of naively at the beginning. Uh, and some things that are, are quite compelling in terms of looking at how it varies across the city, where we're seeing a lot of over-reporting in some of the more uh, uh, the wealthier neighborhoods of, of New York City, for instance, and under-reporting in certain poor neighborhoods, although this is not a clear, clear dynamic. So it's kind of interesting to see how important understanding the underlying fundamentals actually can be. And so from here, we looked at actually the underlying uh, socioeconomic factors within these different census block groups. And essentially, we find that household characteristics and socioeconomic status and language profici proficiency have non-trivial effects on whether they're in the over or under reporting category. And again, we're, we're working now on other ways of actually doing this kind of analysis, this specific analysis, so we can have quantifiable metrics. So a few things I mentioned, uh, you know, limitations here, of course, are kind of getting that ground truth data. Uh, so we had to back into this, but we think we did it in a, a somewhat responsible, rigorous way, but I think there's other ways of doing it. Um, you know, there's also this question of how do we account for non-quantified uh, characteristics. And a big important 
piece of this is the ground truth, not on just where problems would occur, uh, but also understanding um, uh, some other factors in terms of the actual process of how a complaint gets to a violation through HPD. Uh, as I mentioned, we're really trying to do this to kind of target and improve resource allocation across city services and have 311 office better understand the severity of problems coming in across different neighborhoods. And then as we're getting into this, we're working on specific metrics and coefficients that we can apply across the city to account for this over and under reporting that's observed um, and better understand the magnitude of individual factors and how they contribute to uh, this, this reporting behavior. So thank you very much and happy to talk about it later. Thank you. Interesting setup here. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, drug overdose surveillance. This is work uh, done both at Carnegie Mellon and while visiting New York University uh, with my co-author William Herlins. And uh, thank you to uh, our, our funders and collaborators. So as you all probably know, drug overdoses are getting to be a really serious problem uh, in the US, elsewhere in the world. Um, opioid overdoses in particular. Uh, we have th uh, many thousands of overdose deaths occurring in the United States. Uh, the cystic I saw that just floored me, this was actually just as of a few days ago, was that uh, drug overdoses are contributing to about a two and a half month loss of life expectancy overall in the US. So think about that. Each person, man, woman, child, two and a half months cut off from drug overdose. Um, so clearly, it's a huge problem. And public health has gotten very motivated to address it. And what they really need to do is to actually be able to respond very early and uh, in a targeted way to emerging trends in overdoses. So where is affected? Who is affected? Uh, what sort of drugs are actually causing the problems? And again, if they can do this, the hope is that they can actually prevent these emerging trends in clusters and reduce the overall number of overdoses. So I'd argue that uh, machine learning has the potential to make a huge difference here and to save lives uh, by enabling this sort of process by public health. In particular, we want to be able to integrate multiple data sources across space, time, and various subpopulations uh, to detect these emerging clusters of overdoses in their very subtle, very early stages, and finally, help public health to target an effective response, which could be naloxone distribution, could be uh, treatment of uh, addicted individuals, uh, better education campaigns, et cetera. Uh, also, in the longer term, in addition to this kind of near real time approach, we also want to be able to quantify the effects of legislative and policy changes and understand, right, big picture, what works and what doesn't. So what I'm going to talk about today is really two uh, fairly preliminary case studies, and basically one in the case where we have a lot of data and, uh, about individuals and, uh, th that overdosed, and one where we have very little data. Right? We're just thinking about uh, counts at a coarser grain spatial and temporal resolution. Now, I'd argue uh, in both of these cases, existing machine learning methods just don't work that well. And this is really a nice case where uh, these very important problems necessitate the development of new methodology. So our first case study, we're focusing on Al in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. This is work with the Department of Human Services, including about eight uh, years of analysis for, of uh, retrospective data. And the eventual goal is to actually help them to build prospective surveillance tools. Uh, we've had 2,000 cases in Allegheny County over those uh, eight years. Uh, again, each of these is a fatal accidental death by drug overdose. Um, for each victim, we have uh, information about uh, date, uh, zip code, uh, age, gender, race, and the set of all the drugs that were present in their system from a, basically a toxicology screening. And so I think about this as basically 30 dimensional data, not including the spatial and temporal dimensions. Uh, so what we did is we developed a new pattern detection method, which we call the multi-dimensional tensor scan. And again, we're trying to identify these clusters that may be geographic, demographic, and behavioral, or any combination thereof. Uh, we're trying to do earlier detection. Again, imagine monitoring uh, this sort of data um, daily. Uh, again, better characterize both where and who uh, in the county is affected. And try imagine doing something like this, being able to say, OK, it's actually, we have a trend emerging. Maybe it's in these four star zip codes here, affecting predominantly white males age 20 to 49 who indulge in a combination of heroin and alcohol. 
Right? And again, being able to target this particular risk group and be able to say, here's where we need to target our intervention. So how's, how does the method work? Uh, not going to go into all the details. But basically, this is a way of finding subspaces of a very large attribute space with higher than expected numbers of recent case counts. So what we can do is essentially two steps. One is figure out what we expect to see, kind of what is business as usual. And uh, to do that, we use a novel uh, tensor decomposition approach, which again just allows us to say for any combination of geographics, demographics, um, and behaviors, um, what is sort of typical overdose counts. Uh, then, of course, the question is, well, what's weird? What's anomalous? What's emerging? And we, again, have an optimization approach where we're looking for subsets of values for all the attributes. And again, we can actually do this iteratively and use a nice little trick, which actually allows us to do each of these iterations very, very fast. Essentially, what we're doing is we're searching over subsets of the attribute space. Uh, but the tricks we employ allow us to do that in milliseconds, as opposed to an exhaustive search, which would take millions of years. So I'll show you some results. Uh, a lot of the clusters, uh, kind of the most uh, worrisome, involve the uh, fentanyl, right? which is a dangerous drug, which is about 40 to 100 times more potent than heroin. Um, we saw a lot of different clusters um, of fentanyl-related deaths. Uh, one of the biggest ones uh, in March to April 2015 involved 26 deaths countywide, uh, again, just in that 30-day um, span. Uh, turns out that uh, some of that, right, they had heroin as a uh, cofactor, but a lot of them was, ju was just fentanyl. So there's probably fentanyl essentially masquerading as heroin. So one of the interesting things about this cluster is that it actually started very small, started with five geographically and demographically similar cases in the first few days of that big cluster. And so again, this is a retrospective analysis, but the argument is that if we'd been doing this prospectively, right, we might have actually been able to target that pattern and hopefully stop it from spreading. So um, we found another very interesting set of overdose clusters involving methadone, which is very commonly used to treat heroin addiction, and the prescription drug Xanax. Well, it turns out that the combination of these two gets you high, but also kills you. Um, so from about 2008 to 2012, we observed multiple clusters of this sort against uh, typically three to seven cases each and localized in space and time. The really interesting thing, though, was from 2013 onward, these clusters essentially vanished. And one of the things we started talking about with our public health collaborators was, okay, why might this change actually have been the case? And we found something very interesting, which is as of October 2012, Pennsylvania passed the Methadone Death and Incident Review Act that actually increased state oversight of methadone clinics, of prescribing doctors, and so on. Now, of course, we can't necessarily isolate that factor. There are other things involved, like uh, approval of alternative treatments other than methadone. Uh, but again, we believe that that first, uh, again, this policy change actually did have a big impact on these sort of methadone, and particularly methadone plus Xanax overdose clusters. For our second case study, again, with much less data, we thought about uh, overdoses in New York. And here we didn't have victim level data. What we had is aggregate monthly counts of fatal overdoses, uh, opio opioid overdoses for six New York counties, about uh, 17 years of data for this one. Um, so here we really thought about, OK, so there's a space time problem. right? But we really want to understand how we can both estimate typical trends and identify any anomalous spikes. And of course, the challenge here really boils down to the fact that data points are correlated in space and time. So it's very easy to run into cases where you just end up with correlated noise and you think that it's an anomalous spike and really, well, it's just noise. So actually being able to deal with this case correctly turned out to be a very interesting and uh, um, stimulating statistical challenge. Uh, so we developed a new approach to do this. We uh, combined basically Gaussian processes, a way of modeling correlated data with our subset scanning approach. And again, one thing this allows us to do is to, uh, to both say, you know, here, here is a good model of normal, so we can accurately identify deviations from normal. What we found was that there were really two big spikes in um, opioid-related deaths in New York, two statistically significant anomalous patterns. Um, the first one occurred in mid-2006. And the really interesting bit of this was actually in late 2006 was when New York started implementing all of their naloxone programs, right? Again, distribute uh, Narcan, right, to uh, hopefully prevent overdoses. Um, so the idea is this might have actually been a much bigger spike, right, if New York hadn't done this, 
It's also possible that their implementation of these programs and the spreading of these programs around the city right, might have actually been due to you know, a public outcry about this particular spike. The other thing we saw at the end of 2015, as I mentioned, this uh, fentanyl has been a really big problem. And this recent surge is primarily driven by uh, fentanyl-related overdoses. So it turns out if you were to just throw generic machine learning methods at this, right, just your standard off-the-shelf anomaly detector, you don't find these patterns. Actually, what do you find? Well, you just find wherever the individual counts were high, and it becomes a lot harder to capture the significant trends. So again, this is an example where it really is important to think not just about, we've got good data, let's throw any old machine learning method at it, but actually coming up with the right methods that work for this data. Uh, so finally, our retrospective analysis suggests uh, some potential utility for what we really want to do, which is to get a prospective surveillance tool out there and to target um, public health responses effectively. And finally, I'll just note that actually this sort of multi-dimensional scanning approach can be applied to many other tasks. Uh, we've started talking with uh, Chicago's Department of Health about doing this for sexually transmitted illness, et cetera. OK, so I'll stop here. Uh, thank you for listening. Great, thanks. Um, oops. I'm Katie, and I'm a PhD student at UMass Amherst. And today I'll talk about our project of automatically identifying civilians killed by police from news articles. This is joint work with a number of other student collaborators and my advisor, Brendan, who's also in the audience today. Um, so as I'm sure many of you are well aware, over the past few years in the US, um, we've witnessed a staggering number of high-profile police killings, including the four I mentioned here. Eric Garner in New York, Michael Brown in Ferguson, Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge, and Philando Castile in Falcon Heights. And these deaths have prompted policymakers, social scientists, and the public to ask a number of questions, such as, are there simply fewer or less deaths than there were last year at the federal level? Um, is there any sort of racial disparity or discrimination happening across the country? Um, and can we identify the most effective police departments and the policing methods that they use? And all of these questions require extensive data in order to be adequately answered. Um, and for the rest of this presentation, our work is going to focus on this first question about pure fatality statistics. So naturally, a first place to look for these statistics on police fatalities would be the federal government. Um, but in 2015, the Department of Justice issued an internal study um, where they estimated during this time period, 2003 to 2009 and 2011, there was around 7,500 people killed by police in the US. However, the Arrest Related Deaths Program, or ARD, which is an internal Department of Justice Statistics um, study, only captured about 50% of this. And this is direct reporting from local and state governments to the federal government. The FBI's supplemental, supplemental homicide reports um, captured even less. And there was some overlap between these two programs, but it's still undercounting deaths by about 2,000 during this time period. And this, this undercounting and the variability in this is largely due to variability in how local and state governments comply with the federal government's request for information. So an alternative to government data is to manually read news reports where some of these um, police fatality events are talked about and manually extract relevant information to populate a police fatality database of victims and um, information surrounding the events. And this approach, th this manual approach, has been adopted by a number of journalists and volunteer groups, including Fatal Encounters, Killed by Police, The Guardian, and The Washington Post. And if you look specifically at fatal encounters, which we found to be the most extensive of, of these various sources, um, the, the, their list of names, which is the actual list of, of every person they've found during this time period that's been killed by police, is actually greater than the estimated number by the government. So clearly, this, this discrepancy between um, what these official government programs are reporting and the actual number of deaths is a huge problem. Um, and this really is the overall motivation for our work. So we want to provide public data, and we want government accountability. But there are two main problems with these existing approaches that are out there. 
The first is that these types of manual updates to databases are extremely expensive. So it takes volunteers or um, paid staff uh, many hours to, to populate these databases, and there's a huge emotional toll of reading about deaths over and over. And the other thing is, unfortunately, these, ki these types of police killings are going to continue to occur in the future, and so a full, complete database um, will need to continuously be updated. Um, so our goal is to replace these manual updates with automatic ones. And I'm going to give a very high level overview of how we do this. So first, we scrape news articles relating to police fatalities. And then from this collection of news documents, we're going to extract every single sentence that has a named entity that's a person. And then for every one of these sentences, we're going to classify it using a machine learning classifier as to whether or not it indicates a police fatality event. Once we have these sentence level um, Class classifications, we're going to aggregate those by entity and decide whether or not to add that entity to our police fatality database. So in order to collect our data, we ran a keyword querying web scraper throughout 2016 on Google News. Um, we applied standard uh, natural language processing pre-processing pre to our documents to arrive at roughly 900,000 training documents and 350,000 testing documents related to police fatalities. Um, so our task is to simulate a database update. And we do this by first establishing a train test split. I'm going to explain how we do this within this machine learning framework. So we establish a train test split. In our case, it's September 1st, 2016. And all the documents we collected in 2016 after this train test split will be used during test time. All the documents before this train test split that were published before September 1st, 2016, we're going to use at train time. And at training time, we're going to develop a supervised machine learning classifier model. And what this means is we're going to need labels on our sentences as to whether or not they indicate police fatalities. So we're going to use something called distance supervision, which we go into much greater detail in our paper. But the gist of it is we can use this gold database of ground truth of who has been killed by police. We're going to use fatal encounters over here to the right. And we can impute the labels on these names to the names in the sentences in our collection of news documents. Once we have our trained model, at test time, the goal is given an input of raw text documents possibly related to police fatalities, can we predict the names of people killed by police? And at test time, we're also going to use fatal encounters for evaluation. So we're able to evaluate our model and figure out if the predicted names um, are truly people killed by police. So we use two sentence level classifiers. The first is featured engineered logistic regression. And the important part here is that we're using syntactic dependency paths, like you see on the right. So hopefully, you'll get something like target. Our target name is a nominal passive subject of the verb killed, which is an agent of police. Um, so getting at some of that semantic information about killed by police. We're also going to use convolutional neural networks, which were used in other event detection work as well. Um, once we have these sentence level labels given by those classifiers, we're going to need a way to aggregate them. And we're going to use something called the noisy or equation, which again, there's more details in our paper. But at a very high level, this says that if at least one sentence indicates with high probability that a police fatality event occurred, then we're going to give a high probability to that entity being someone who has been killed by police. So uh, full quantitative results, again, are in our paper. But just to give you some, some qualitative results here, Here's a printout of the top 20 entities our model predicts at test time. Um, so you'll see a rank. So they're able, because it's a probabilistic model, we can rank the predictions by how likely we think they are. Um, we'll give a name. And then uh, we can evaluate against fatal encounters, our ground truth data, as to whether or not this is a true positive, so somebody that's actually been killed by police. And if you zoom in here on the false positive, so these are things that are counting against our, model, against our model when we evaluate, we're getting things like name mismatches. So Samuel DeBose is actually in the Fatal Encounters database and somebody that was killed by police, but Sam DeBose was not. Our model is also making predictions um, 
about events that are semantically similar to being killed by police, but not quite the same. So for example, Trayvon Martin was killed, but not by an actual police officer. Um, Logan Clark was shot by police, but not killed. And then we're also picking up on, despite filtering Google News to US News, um, we're still getting names of people who were killed by police outside of the US. So once again, I want to return you to our goal, which was this database update. Given uh, a corpus of news documents, can we populate a database of police fatality events? Um, and so we're hoping to extend this to other domains. So can we identify victims of humanitarian disasters, for example? And right now, we're only extracting the names, but we'd really like to extract additional event information as well, such as if we could get the name, location, and date automatically, that would be a huge step forward in, in populating a greater database. And we're also building an interactive system for, for practitioners to actually use. So we're getting actually weekly feedback from Brian Burkhart, who's the director of Fatal Encounters right now. So what we've really done is made progress towards a fully automatic system. Clearly, we're still going to need some manual input if, uh, for this to be used in practice. But we've also used methods of distant supervision, which is much cheaper than manually annotated uh, documents that you can use in machine learning. And finally, we've defined a new natural language processing task, which we hope the rest of the community can also work on. And we've released our data and code publicly. So please take a look at that link. Thanks. Um, good afternoon. I, my name is Sarah Menker. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Grow Intelligence. And we've built a search and predictive engine around global food and agriculture. Uh, before I start my talk, I just, I'm just going to do a quick survey. How many people have been involved in any conversations around food security um, domestically or globally? I just want to get a sense of context. OK. All right. So. <laughs> As, as those of you who have attended these conferences and, and dialogues know, um, the classic way by which all of these conferences nowadays open is by asking this question. How do we feed 9 billion people by 2050? And then goes on to answer it by saying, we need to produce 70% more food. Now, one of the things in terms of context here is how this narrative came to be was that after 2008, 2008, global food and actually commodity prices hit all time highs. And governments had started to scramble and needed to show the world they were doing something. So this narrative actually emerged in 2009, shortly after that. Not many people questioned how these numbers came to be, meaning the population of, you know, first of all, by 2050, will be about 9.7 billion people. But also, how did 2050 become the year we care about? Like, why, why are we focused on it? So at GROW, what, what we do is, is we think about the world of food and agriculture. And this means that we really think about the tiny components that drive it, meaning everything from climate and environment all the way to markets. And we think about how we bring all of that together to try and understand the global system. And by background, I was a commodities trader. And that's essentially all you do all day long when you're trading, <laughs> is trying to figure out system imbalances. And so one of the obsessions that I had, and I was an energy trader, but one of the obsessions that had kind of evolved out of this conversation was, was really how do we figure out the tipping point in global food and agriculture? right? And, the, and this tipping point is the point at which things fundamentally change and nothing is ever the same again. right? So similar things include the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Um, we can recover from it, but nothing's ever the same again. And so, we set out to solve this problem at Grow. We, we, we solve very hyper-localized, hyper-specific problems, like how do we predict yields of a very specific crop in a particular region throughout the growing season. But we also think about how those very specific models feed into the global system to help us figure out this, this, this tipping point. And so we discovered two things um, when, when we built this model. One was that. The way that it's framed is completely incorrect. 70% more food implies you know, basically all foods are created equal, and that we're thinking in terms of mass. We discovered that what we needed to do is start to think in terms of calories. 
Second of all, we discovered that the tipping point is actually a decade from now, not 2050. Now, most of us don't know what our lives are going to be like in 30 plus years, but I think most of us write five year plans and can certainly see, you know, we, we can imagine what life looks like in 10 years time. And this actually changes the urgency of the problem drastically and how we need to address it. And this, this tipping point is basically the point at which the system's structural capacity to produce food to meet growing demand will break unless we commit to some type of change. So there are solutions to it, but we need to have some pretty fundamental conversations around it. Now, calories and trillions of calories are very hard to think about. But if you think of 214 trillion calories, that's equivalent to 379 billion Big Macs. That's more Big Macs than McDonald's has ever sold. That's what we need to produce in extra terms by 2027. Now, how do we get there? This was what the world looked like in 40, 40 years ago. So um, in very basic terms, this is looking at what calories were consumed in every country in the world, less the calories produced, right? So if you're seeing red, it's basically there are calorie deficits. So countries were net importing calories, and blue are net exporters of calories. Now, the light red and light blue is kind of self-sufficient to some extent. You, you're, you're kind of toggling between. But one of the distinct things about the world 40 years ago was that the US was by far the greatest exporter and Argentina was there. But most of the world, including Europe, were actually net importers of food. China was self-sufficient. This is what the world looks like today. What happened here is, A, you had the emergence of South America as an agricultural powerhouse. India actually became food self-sufficient. Pretty much every African country either remained a net importer or became a net importer. And China went from that light blue to the brightest red that you see. China was lucky. And the reason it was lucky is that it coincided with essentially the agricultural boom in South America and Europe. Had that not occurred, the world would have been in a very, very imbalanced state today. So how do we get here? This is just the journey of India, China, and African countries. And, the, and the, these are really the regions to focus on for the next 10 years. They all started off with very similar trajectories. And what had happened is that India actually committed to a green revolution, which is the blue line, which is why you see that it's kind of been net calorie sufficient throughout. And in the past decade, it's, it's actually started to become a bit of a net exporter. Africa and most African countries never stood a chance. And in the 80s, just skyrocketed as net importers. China had actually managed to remain net flat until the turn of the 21st century. And it was once it took off, that was it. There was no turning back. And this was driven by a combination of population growth and economic growth. Population growth is just number of people. And economic growth means the food that Chinese people consumed started to change, more proteins. For every calorie of meat that we eat, we need about eight calories of grain to produce it. So that's what happened in China. So what's happening in the next 10 years? Well, there's a demographic inflection point coming. In 2023, the combined populations of India, Africa, and China will make up about 55% of the world population. That starts to present pretty significant challenges and stresses on our environment. At that point, Africa actually starts to overtake India and China in terms of population. China starts to flatten out slash decline, and India's slope is declining. However, diets are shifting, and economic growth continues to happen. And so even though you don't have the population constraint, you have significant changes in diet that continue to occur. So what does the world look like in 10 years? So our forecasts that we ran, and this is basically looking at so the, the, the calorie consumption versus the calorie deficits that we had for each country, we basically built a model that predicts what consumption is in each country for each major crop, and then what its structural capacity to continue to produce those crops locally is. And so you're, you're basically on a per crop basis running forecasts both on supply and demand. And, and this is assuming that the system continues to, be, to behave the way it currently is, meaning 
that we're not making any type of fundamental shifts to the way that markets are behaving, operating, the way we're producing food, et cetera. So what you end up with is calorie deficits that are just growing rapidly. And India, as you can see, starts to make that shift out of being net flat to becoming a net importer. Now, the problem with that slight shift that we see, similar to us not being able to predict the slope and the speed at which China was going to become a net importer, that's a really, really risky point and one we need to reverse before we experience it. So what happens on the, on the production side? On the production side, you have net producing regions, net exporting regions. These were the dark blue regions I showed. So it's essentially North America, Europe, and South America. Now, North America and Europe don't actually have much more unfarmed arable land left. So they basically have potential yield increases that they can continue to garner, but the, the incremental increase, so the, basically your yield gap, which is the maximum potential yield that, the, that each region can produce relative to what its current yield is, those gaps in the US and Europe are about 18%. So there's not much more left in the system. South America has some significant upside, but it comes at the significant cost of more deforestation. So it's, it's real kind of economic cost to society again. So what happens? In this as is world today, where we end up is there will be that 214 trillion calorie gap that emerges. And again, this is assuming that actually all the excess calories produced in North America, South America, and Europe are exclusively going to China, India, and African countries. So it's not even taking into account other regions. This is actually a picture of an impossible world <laughs> and one that we can't <laughs> continue to live in. And so what I want to discuss is the solutions. And there are, like I said, there are real solutions to this, right? But they require commitment, and the first one is actually commitment to changing the regions of India and most African countries to dark blue. And that's entirely possible. The reason is the gap, um, the yield potential gap that I mentioned earlier, where there's only about 18% upside in, in the US and in Europe, in most parts of sub-Saharan Africa, you can potentially increase yields in, in key grains by over 5x, right? And so what you need is commercialization in the system that allows for us to actually attain these yield gaps, to, to close these yield gaps. Now, commercialization does not mean mega farms. It actually means using data to optimize, A, how we grow what we grow, B, to change the way the system allocates capital, right? So it does, to some extent, mean requiring and, and asking small scale farmers to produce specialty crops that actually garner higher dollar amounts per field, uh, you know, per acre, and moving production of other crops to more optimal regions. So, but it requires a rebalancing in the system that's quite feasible, and that can actually be done through collaboration between government and reform in the financial industry. And unless we commit to this type of structural change, it's literally near impossible to try and assume that the US will change its consuming behavior and consumption behavior on behalf of the rest of the world, right? I mean, there are solutions like that where you can stop producing corn for ethanol and literally the problem will go away, but that's not going to happen. And so there needs to be some conversation around, A, how do we garner and use all the data that we have to start attacking the system on basically a country level, because then on a hyper-localized level, but essentially start to shift capital in more optimal ways and use data to do that and use it as the great equalizer. Um, so really, the question should not be, how do we feed 9 billion people by 2050? It should be, how do we produce an extra 214 trillion calories per year to feed 8.3 billion people in 2027? If we don't do that, there will be no turning back. And so, you know, obviously I urge everybody to read more and learn more about this. <laughs> Um, and to participate in the conversation. And uh, you know, we're a company that's based in New York and in, and in Kenya, where we, we operate globally. We're hiring, and, and any interesting dialogues, conversations you guys want to have, we're also open to that. Thank you.